हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर सूर्य प्रकाश उपाध्याय फ्रॉम इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी मंडी टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑन द मॉड्यूल सिटीज इन द वर्ल्ड सिस्टम फ्रॉम द पेपर सोशियोलॉजी ऑफ अर्बन ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन सो दिस मॉड्यूल इंट्रोड्यूस द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ अन इवन डेवलपमेंट एंड द वर्ल्ड सिस्टम ऑफ कैपिटलिज्म and their corresponding frameworks for historical and geographical analysis it also develops a relational understanding of the function of particular cities as command and control centers for capital accumulation the module also explores the network of world cities as nodes of varying importance and how these cities influence functioning of global capitalism towards the end this module presents the antecedents of the globalization and world city research network the framework that they adopted the key concepts that are used by by the research network the methods applied for this research the insights and limitations of their findings and major critiques of the approach so in the last 20 years the globalization and the world city research network that is anchored at the university of loboro has produced prolific research on the structure of the world economy based on an understanding of a network of world cities so the globalization and world city research network focuses on world system of capitalism as the appropriate scale for understanding globalization global culture urbanism and the power geometrics between regions in the world economy in the mid 20th century one of the key innovations in sociological analysis came in the form of systems theory systems theory can be simply understood using the analogy of organism a system by this analogy has a definite structure made up of interconnected parts with specific functions and interrelations however the whole is greater than the sum of its part that is the system is holistic thus the key characteristics of a system are boundedness interconnectedness of different parts and their functioning and holism given the general favorability enjoyed by such a structural functional thinking at the time it was no surprise that such an approach was also applied to the understanding of capitalism at an international scale beginning in the 1970s marxist theory has attempted to grapple with capitalism as a phenomenon at the global scale initial theories of capitalism as an international system emerged from latin america particularly brazil in the form of dependency theory andre gunder frank a pioneer of dependency theory posited capitalism as an international system with a peculiar speciality he identified western europe and america as the metropolis where capital is accumulated and other regions as satellites where surplus is extracted the specific argument of dependency theory had to do with the production and reproduction of under development through the creation of developmental aid which made satellite nations that is the former colonies dependent on metropolitan nations that is the formal imperial powers and sustain the system these theorizations emerging from latin america also captured the imaginations of social and political movements in the developing world and particularly in latin america itself during a diplomatic visit to venezuela hugo chavez president of the and president and present during a diplomatic visit to venezuela 
Hugo Chavez presented to US President Barack Obama a copy of the dependency theory book Open Veins of Latin America by Eduardo Galeno. The word system theory was first developed in 1970 by Emmanuel Wallenstein. More specifically, used systems theory to understand capitalism in its global functioning. In Wallenstein's theory, the system was defined by an international division of labor. He classified nation states into core, periphery, and semi periphery. The core nations have a greater concentration of high skill and capital industries, while peripheral nations have a greater concentration of low skill and labor intensive industries. This structure of international capitalism results in an unequal exchange between core and periphery. The core with greater technological development extracts raw materials at low cost from the periphery to produce high value commodities and services. While the periphery to even aspire to do the same would need to invest in extremely expensive technology transfers and in increasing the skills of workers. Thus, this pre-existing division of labor systematically produces uneven development because nations are effectively locked into place and it perpetuates the extraction of resources away from the periphery to the core. This, in a nutshell, is the functioning of the capitalist world system. World system theory has been extremely influential in the way the history and international politics of development and capital capitalism is understood. Within development studies, dependency theory and world system theory provided an alternative imagination of world history as compared to the modernization theory of the likes of W. W. Rostov and so on. Modernization theorists have often been accused of representing time and history as a hollow dimension because they understand development in a crudely evolutionary framework that pits all the nations of the world in one progression with the developing countries attempting to catch up with the developments. This idea of history as culminating at a particular stage is known as historicism or in a better sense in a very theological thinking. World system theory on the contrary presents a historical worldview where nations at different stages of development are no longer placed in a progression but acknowledged to be co-constitutive as opposed to the theological race to modernization history and geography are shown to be fractured and development is shown to be a fundamentally uneven process that occurs in one place at the cost of X proportion of resources or surplus from another place. This understanding of history and development allows us to appreciate the coevalness or simultaneous existence of vastly different temporalities or geographies. The work of dependency theory and world system theory was later carried forward by the likes of Egyptian scholar Samir Amin who spoke of peripheral capitalism. Amin points to the following features that define capitalism in peripheral nations. That is the rapid urbanization, formation of a local bourgeoisie and elite with whom wealth is concentrated. And imbalanced industrial sector and also a heavy reliance on foreign aid. Therefore, 
the first of these three features that is rapid urbanization is most relevant to us in this module world system theory identifies nation states as the elements of the system and within these nations are other regions and city regions in fact both andre gunder frank and emelon wallstein identify that within these nations also one finds similar systems with a core in certain cities connected to the peripheral country side for example if we have to explain this in a better way suppose how or let's say how london tokyo are related to bomb to mumbai or let's say to colombo similarly in a same fashion if you locate the same thing in india you also find the cities like lucknow or kanpur or bhubneshwar or any other city apart from the met metros where you have large scale of concentration of capital and business you find the same kind of dependency theory working and that is what on the emel wallerstein and trying to explain us yet in the time they were written the nation state and the mosaic of states that formed the world were the intuitive units of analysis beginning in the 1980s however these units of analysis were no longer intuitive the world system theory has been extremely influential in shaping critical thinking about global capitalism and international relations but has undergone certain modifications in the light of what david harvey a renowned critical geographer has called space time comprehension the challenge to its original formulation arose because the international character of capitalism was clear systems theory or world system theory could not grasp the global scope of the new form of capitalism what has been called the post industrial capitalism or optimistically late capitalism since the 1980s due to rapid advances in information and communication technologies what we call as icts it has become possible for transnational communication to take place instantaneously thus virtually annihilating the distance between far off regions that is that now you are sitting in india and you can immediately call upon your business partner in london or new york or los angeles so for capitalism this has meant that diverse operations taking place across different regions can be coordinated and monitored simultaneously for this reason firms locate their command and control centers in specific places from where other nodes of production can be managed through the use of the icts this new architecture of capitalist operations management and the production of hierarchies between the highest control centers and other nodes in the network prompted manuel castles to name them as spaces of flows with different intensities of flows of information so the world system theory identifies nation states as the elements of the system and within these nations nations are other regions and city regions in fact both andre gunder frank and emmanuel wallerstein identify that within these nations also one finds similar systems with a core in certain cities connected to the peripheral countryside yet in the time they were written the nation state and the mosaic of states that formed the world were the intuitive units of analysis but with the beginning in 1980s these units of analysis were no longer so intuitive so the world system theory has been extremely influential 
in shaping critical thinking about global capitalism and international relations, but has undergone certain modifications in the light of what David Harvey, a renowned ge critical geographer, has called space-time comprehension. The challenge to this original formulation arose because while the international char character of capitalism was clear, the theory could not grasp the global scope of the new form of capitalism, what has been called the post-industrial capitalism or optimistically the late capitalism. Since the 1980s, due to rapid advances in information and communication technologies, it has become possible for transnational communication to take place instantaneously. Thus, virtually annihilating the distance between far off ranges. For capitalism, this has meant that diverse operations taking place across different regions can be coordinated and monitored simultaneously. So for this reason, firms locate their command and control centers in specific places from where other nodes of production can be managed through the use of ICTs. This new architecture of capitalist operations and management and the production of hierarchies between the highest control centers and other nodes in the network prompted Manuel Castells to name them as species of flow with different and these species of flows have differing intensities of flow of information also. At around the same time, there were major shifts taking place in nations around the world. In the early 1980s, Britain and America under the leadership of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan respectively pioneered a process of liberalization which resulted in huge disinvestments in the public sector, deregulation of markets, and favoring of free trade across national borders. The, these measures were also introduced in Latin America through structural adjustment clauses attached to loans, loans taken from the transnational financial institutions such as the World Bank and the International Monetary, Monetary Fund that is IMF. Developing countries in Asia and Africa followed the this, followed this suit. The structural adjustments inaugurated an extensive field of critical theory and the processes that ensued were given the name neoliberalism. With the neoliberal policies adopted or made to be adopted by most countries in the world, the flow of goods and capital across national boundaries had significantly increased. With this free or freer flow of information, capital and goods across national boundaries, questions had begun to be raised about the very significance of national territor territories in an understanding of capitalism. Thus, the very definition of the word system as a mosaic of nation states was found to be less useful in the new context where capitalist firms had grown increasingly autonomous in relation to nation states. What we comprehend that neoliberalism is just another name for the globalization of capitalism. With the global character of capitalism be being more conspic conspicuous than ever, the need for a transnational understanding me, that is across nations but also understanding beyond the idea of nations was more pressing. The possible strategy for reformulating the understanding of the world system came from the right, writings of Saskia Sassen, Peter Taylor, Paul Knox and a, a few scholars who turned to the network of cities rather than the mosaic of nation states as the appropriate scale of under, to understand global capitalism. In the dawn of the information age or post-industrial capitalism that we described earlier, 
it was believed that the that ICTs would make face to face interaction redundant and would render would, would render urban agglomerations obsolete and creating a hyper connected global village this imagination of agglomeration becoming obsolete is one major aspect of the idea of a post industrial society however this imagined process of deurbanization never occurred on the contrary the new ict industries themselves and the ict powered global financial firms were thriving in sites of agglomeration such as silicon valley in california and wall street which continued to dominate the world there's a technologies that were imagined to allow human settlements to spread out themselves created very dense agglomerations of businesses and people and that is what manuel castles had had called technopoles so this continuity of urbanization and significance of cities to capitalist accumulation provoked theorizations of urban beyond their being sites of production or consumption the value of reciprocity trust transfer of tacit knowledge and other effective transfers was recognized as a crucial aspect of urban life and the urban was recognized as a crucial site for capitalist accumulation that we have discussed in other models as well and these urban centers were also important sites as a com as a sites of command and control of firms they that that operate at the global scale so while cities are obviously constrained by policies of particular nation states and are attached to vast vast country regions that are excluded from the spaces of flow the sheer intensity of their connectivity to and uh, connectivity to and interactions with cities in other nation national territories and the immense magnitude of the of such interactions compelled theorists to privilege the transnational relations of cities over their national constraints saskia sasen in 1991 argues that contemporary capitalism is based on a peculiar duality that is the spatial dispersal of economic activity but the global integration of the markets thus erstwhile industrial hubs located in developed countries such as america and japan gradually dissolved in favor of setting up manufacturing plants in developing countries while managing firms from the from developed countries yet while commodity production has been especially dispersed neoliberal policy shifts across the world have created an integrated global market for goods in such a scenario cities occupy a crucial place as command and control centers for the especially dispersed operations of firms they are also the sites where finance capital is concentrated and transacted in addition the classical functions of cities as sites of production and consumption make them hubs of innovations and also markets for products and services thus it is cities and not the nation states that are key nodes in the world economy the work of friedman also pointed to cities as key command centers in the new international division of labor friedman actually went on to produce one of the first hierarchical list of world cities on the basis of four different kinds of articulations global financial articulations multinational articulations important national articulations and subnational regional articulation he also explicitly uses the world systems approach to identify primary and secondary cities in the core and periphery friedman identified 
New York, London and Tokyo as the global cities that is and they are the paramount nodes in the world economy. Saskia Sassen subsequently justifies the selection of these cities in her book The Global City and based on that she argues that certain advanced producer services are the new drivers of global capitalism and these services include banking, advertising, legal services and so on. This relational approach unveiled a new kind of architecture for the capitalist world system. Sassan notes the existence of a triadic core consisting of America, Western Europe and Japan and understands global capitalism as nodes and sub nodes of a vast network of information and capital flows anchored in the three global cities. The reason for calling them as the global cities because Friedman had already identified these cities as important cities in the global capitalist network and she does the same thing and through these cities she talks about how these cities or these cities function as the node and the different cities word across they work as sub nodes and because the inform because most of the information is stored by the firms that are located in these cities and from from these cities information is circulated to other peripheral cities and these cities in turn process this information and apply it into the system. So this new architecture of the world system captured the imagination of a rich collective of geographers based in the United Kingdom. This group of scholars would go on to constitute the globalization and world cities research network and this network has been pivotal in furthering this research agenda. Their key conceptual innovation was to take focus away from merely cities and city regions and instead focus on cities and city regions in relation with the international network of cities into which they are connected through the flows of information, capital, goods, migrant workers and tourists. So the, if you want to take it as an example, the Mum city like, like Mumbai is not understood in isolation. Rather, what kind of network it forms with other cities, let's say with Singapore or Sydney or Johannesburg, so this is the kind of innovation that this group is bringing in because now the city is not really, is not simply connected but it also they get influenced by the other cities especially the cities that are sitting at the command center the control center 1999 research network called globalization and world cities research network put forth a first roster of 55 world cities above and beyond the widely accepted global cities of New York, London and Tokyo which were classified as alpha, beta and gamma cities and based on their connectedness to other cities in the roster. So from 1999 onwards the GAWC periodically updated and enhanced the roster of cities and have provided some very cogent insights into global capitalism and into the significance and function of cities in the world economy. These rosters are produced based on a computation of a city's global capacity. In the earliest roster, 
the global capacity of a city was calculated by identifying key advanced producer services and enumerating the number of firms with global competence operating in the city as well as the scale of their operations. One can say if you want to understand or differentiate or, or put, put a some kind of hierarchy, you have to understand compare two different cities. Let's say if you are comparing Singapore with Delhi or Mumbai or any city in India, then you what you do, you look at the number of companies that have the global competence as well as what kind of work and the scale of their network that they have built up that need to be considered while you talk about the global capacity. So in this case, there would be a very few city, few firms from India which will qualify for global competence. Rather, would be a number of such firms in Singapore or New York who would be operating in the city and their scale operations would be very, very large what you have in India. So therefore, the world system in the form of a world city network is the new theater of accumulation. This is the view of the GAWC group. And the three regions in particular, that is the North America, Western Europe and Pacific Asia are the major globalization arenas. They provide the fertile ground for the emergence of world cities. Now, one can ask, what does this architecture mean for those cities that do not make it to the roster of world cities? Something that we are going to talk about in our module on small scale, small town cultures and small town governance also. But it has to be kept in mind that how this global network has influenced the smaller cities or those that are not connect, very well connected to the within the network of these global cities. So, what does it mean for activities in the city besides advanced producer services? So, these are some of the questions that one needs to understand and take into consideration while talking about the about the world system and, and the global cities. So the classification of cities into alpha, beta and gamma classes identifies a hierarchy of cities and but also further refuse it. The classification intended as a critical tool becomes a tool for measuring the competitiveness of the cities in the world economy. The proxies used to place cities in particular classes become valorized and cities around the world who are off the map desire to acquire assets such that they might rise in the rankings. Thus, cities across the world why for globally competent firms to set up a facility in their city regions. The primacy of advanced producer services becomes an actuality in popular and policy discourse and is seen as the most legitimate marker of progress or urban transformation. GAWC research network itself offers little to prevent this, this reification. Given their interest in empirically and longitudinally tracing the architecture of the world city network, the reinforcement of their own tools in the global competitiveness are not explicitly reflected upon. In any case, the influence of the hierarchically superior cities is seen as cultural influence and the world city network as the stage for 
the articulation of global culture but apart from the cities which are off the map there are regions and places within the world cities which are off the grid like knox acknowledges this intercity and internal structures of world cities and presents two sides of the world system namely the fast world and the slow world and this is analogous to manuel castells classic classification of spaces of flows and spaces of places so knox further classifies slow world into suburbs which act as sub nodes to the places which acts as sub nodes to the world cities while siberia is the disconnected hinterland in the indian context this interregional division of labor has been articulated with the metaphor of caste system as consisting of software brahmins hardware shudras and network outcasts this discussion of disconnectivity and differential connectivity is meant to flag one of the shortcoming comings of the gwc approach namely that it focuses over bearingly on advanced producer services in very particular spaces which are largely distributed in the triadic core of the world system as banal and anand maringanti put it using the rhetoric flowing from dependency theory gwc's research agenda reflects a largely metropolitan concern and gwc research misses out of what stephen graham has called splintering urbanism while the space of flows the advanced producer services or the command and control centers are one aspect of the city and important part of to comprehend for an appreciation of global capitalism missing out on the splintered fragments produced simultaneously with these spaces of flows ultimately gives us a partial image of the world system or global capitalism so this group has internally been criticized and as saskia sasen she also criticizes the lack of specification in gwc literature of the practices that constitute what we call economic globalization and global control similarly knox also points out that while the world city network is seen as defining and articulating a global culture it is not very clear where the articulations of this culture are geographically located so students let us now summarize what we have learned in this module the globalization and world city research network that is a collective of exemplary scholars has produced a significant body of auto critique and internal debates and much of this debate is methodological and some of it's also conceptual for instance saska sasen criticizes the lack of specification in globalization and world city literature of the practices that constitute what we call economic globalization and global control similarly knox points out that the that while the world city network is seen as defining and articulating a global culture it is not very clear where the articulations of this culture are geographically located the critique of globalization and world city research network from outside of the group has come from what is now cast as a single opposing perspective and this is this odd ordinary cities perspective which we have discussed in module 1.4 that's titled as ordinary cities
they point out that this identification of particular cities as forerunner, forerunners in urbanization is problematic for three reasons. Firstly, it suffers from being Eurocentric and privileging the narrative of modernity as formulated and articulated in the history of Paris or London or whichever other city. In that sense, the universality of experience is a veneer over an actually parochial assertion to being extraordinary. Secondly, and as a corollary to, to its Eurocentric character, it rehearses the old historic historicist trope of casting all other cities as laggards in the game of catch-up. Thirdly, it effaces the particularity of urban experience as well as, and by extension extension, all theory emerging from other cities are treated as singular narratives, thus recurrently ossifying pre-existing hierarchies of attention directed to extraordinary cities and leaving other cities and their experiences outside the overarching research narrative. While the criticism of globalization and world city research is valid, the network has consistently produced high quality research based on longitudinal data, data sets. So this vast body of research offers a compelling theory about the influence wielded by certain extraordinary cities in controlling economic globalization. While it must be argued that global culture is articulated in spaces other than these world cities. The hegemonies over cultural production held by the world cities is indisputable. The important point to note while using the framework of GWC research network is what the network themselves called the placelessness of world cities. So there is a certain usefulness of this understanding of flows and boundless space, but placelessness is not the nature of the world. It offers a particular relational understanding of urbanism that allows us to link up vastly diverse urban contexts from across the globe, but is only useful as a background for understanding local specificities and different manifestations of processes such as neoliberalization across the world. Acknowledging the specificity in the face of this placeness theory is important because we need to balance the power geometrics in shaping policies and discourses around the urbanism which, is, which are skewed heavily in favor of the cities which are on, which are on the map rather than off the map. Thank you.